Today is Tuesday, September 10th. Damien, what's on your mind? I was talking to my mother the uh, last few days. and She's been in Sarajevo cleaning up the affairs of my recently passed great aunt, who was in her late 90s. And one of the things that she left behind is, is an apartment that my mother inherited a part of, other family members inherited a part of. And uh, my mother also inherited the family papers. My great aunt lived the last 40 years of her life as a widow, and she also lost her daughter when her daughter was in her early 20s from a heart defect. And uh, she lived with my, my great-grandmother. Uh, also for the last, for basically her entire life. My great-grandmother died in the late 90s after the uh, Bosnian War. Now, Sarajevo, if you're not aware, Sarajevo is in modern-day Bosnia, which is in uh, also uh, earlier in the modern-day Yugoslavia, which before that was part of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, which part of that was part, before that was part of Austria-Hungary, which before that was part of the Ottoman Empire. So it's a place that's changed hands a bit. Uh, it's it's very fluid, and my mother's going through the family papers, and my great grandmother, so my mother's grandmother, my aunt's mother, she was a Babarovich. Her name was Dushana Babarovich, and she had three brothers. One of who was Dushan Babarovich. The Babarovich family was a family before the uh, communist takeover of um, Yugoslavia. Not a knock on it. My grandfather was communist. My dad was part of the communist party. You know, uh, I would have been in the Young Partisans. You know, if I didn't move to the U.S. Not a knock. Uh, so my great grandmother, Dushana, was a Babarovich. Now the Babarovich family is uh, it's a it's a it was a royal family or, or a noble family, and her grandmother was at the court where Prince Ferdinand and his wife arrived in Sarajevo uh, right before, you know, about a half hour before he would have been shot by Gavrilo Princip with a Browning pistol on the Gavrilo Princip bridge. Gavrilo Princip also had a brother who threw a grenade that never went off. Oh! Uh, incidentally, where, uh, I, uh, where I lived in uh, Sarajevo, uh, you know, which would be with my grandmother, Gavrilo Princip's granddaughter, no, Gavrilo Princip's brother's granddaughter was my grandmother's best friend, and she lived on the floor down from us, you know? And I have one of the paintings she gifted for her, my wedding in my, in my room. So it's, 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 a, it's a small place, Sarajevo. Again, changed hands, small place. Why am I telling you this? So my, my mother is going through the papers, and in those papers is a photo album and diplomas and a wedding certificate of my grandmother's brother, Dushan Babarovich, and his wife, Blanka Babarovich, who was born Blanka Papo. P-A-P-O. Maybe in the West it would be spelled P-A-P-P-O. Uh, Blanka Papo was a Jewish woman. Uh, and during the war, World War II, uh, she and her entire family were arrested uh, by Gestapo elements, whether they were German Nazis or Serbian collaborators or Croatian collaborators, nobody really knows. Probably Serbian or you know, Nazi collaborators. And my great uncle, so Dushan Babarovic, who had been dating her the entire period before the war, um, he organized um, his friends. They were all maintenance workers at the time during the war. And they somehow snuck her out of jail. They, the story that is remembered is that her head was shaved. They shaved her head. They put on men's clothes on her and they took her out of the jail. And the remainder of the war, she lived with my great grandmother and my aunt who just died and my great aunt and uh, Dushan in this apartment that my mother just inherited. And she was behind, she would, during the day, she would be behind a false wall. And then at night she would come out. After the war she survived, none of her family did. The remainder of her family that were in that jail cell didn't break out, were all uh, murdered 
in concentration camps, in cold blood, as were many of uh, the Jewish people in the city of Sarajevo. But she survived and she married my great uncle. She went to the Sorbonne after the war and she studied and she became a pharmacy, doctor pharmacy. She then became a very well respected professor at either the University of Belgrade or Zagreb, and I'm not sure. And she became the dean of the pharmacy school there. And eventually she moved to Spain with her family and her son died young. He was my mother's cousin, you know, uh, you know, first cousin once removed, whatever it is. And then, but his son survived somewhere, but we don't know. But we have pictures of him when he was a baby. What's interesting to me in this story, I mean, there's many interesting things, is that I had heard kind of like parts of this tale growing up and I'd mixed it up. I was like, okay, I think we lived in what was traditionally known as like a Jewish quarter in Sarajevo. And I know we had Jewish neighbors and I know that many of those Jewish neighbors didn't survive the war or move to Israel or move to other places. When I was a kid, I'd say, oh, there was a Jewish family that was hiding in the walls of the house. And I went from thinking later, oh, that sounds heroic to, that sounds unlikely, to did we take a house from a Jewish family? But it, in fact, we didn't take a house, thank God. Um, my great uncle married this Jewish woman he was in love with, who he had to save from a jail and her all her family were killed and she became this professor. Um, and I have this deep desire to now go and track down her grandson who's somewhere possibly in Spain. But what I'm thinking about too is that uh, there's so many different movements that happened. The ground underneath people's feet moved many times during this story. That apartment where Blanca survived the war was initially bought by my great, great grandfather and grandmother before World War II. They had Jewish neighbors on the third floor who, when World War II broke out, or right after, or during, I'm not sure, moved to Israel, right? They had neighbors on the second floor, some of whom seemed to have moved to Holland, some of them who did not survive the war. And then we had this woman who moved in to be hidden and then became a part of our family. And these are all immigrant stories. And the push factors are the very worst kind, right? The push factor of genocide, right? The pull factor of getting to safety. And for most of the people involved in the story, actually, I don't know their names. I don't know the names of Blanca's family members, of who there were many. All I know is that they died. I know that they were and that they died. And I know that she survived. And I want to feel some pride about that as a member of the family. But at the same time, that's not the right emotion, right? Because really, Sarajevo lost almost its entire Jewish population as did most of Yugoslavia. And by lost, I mean they were murdered. And some small minority were forced to flee and successfully did so. So at the end of your life, at the end of, you might very well not be remembered. And maybe if you're lucky, somebody remembers a couple of sentences. And if you're really lucky or maybe inspiring and somebody's around to actually catch and understand your story. Maybe, maybe more people will know your name. So today I'm putting up the name of this woman, Blanka Babarovic, born Blanka Papo, which if you look is a, probably has its origins that name and uh, Papo would mean something like old man where Papa comes from. Right, which would give it a kind of a a, a basis in, 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 in 
probably come originating somewhere in, in, in the Greek world. And it was a name given to Jews from Portugal and Spain who, who lived in the Balkans. So that was a common Balkan name. It's not so common anymore. I'm not sure how many Papos there are. There might not be very many. Um, no, I looked this up. There are some in South Africa, but they might not be of the same origin. That's what I'm thinking about, you know, taking it full circle to whenever you see a story of a migrant come to the United States or whenever you see a piece, whether it's a video or whether you're reading about some terrible story that, 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 that somebody has, has endured on their way to the United States, on their way to Europe. I don't know if you, this will make your day happier, right? But look at it this way. That person might very well be the survivor of a far more horrible situation. And that person's story, if you listen to it, might end up inspiring you. But if you don't listen to it, nobody might know about it at all. So there's a, there's a humanity inherent in just listening and being aware. And I am very, very aware of that right now as we, as my mother is going through these papers and discovering or rediscovering, perhaps filling out uh, a portion of our family history that I previously sort of knew about, but hope to find out a lot more about in the future. That's what I'm thinking about.